Do you trust your crypto assets to centralized exchanges that actively sell your private information and front run your trades? Would you like to buy and sell your assets without any middlemen, intermediaries, or robots? Do you like paying slippage fees and having the price go up as bots steal from you on low liquidity decentralized exchanges? The solution is nodemarket.io set your guaranteed buy or sell price. No middlemen, no slippage, no bots ever. Buy or sell one, 10, or even 10 million tokens and you never have to worry. OTC trades are between you and the seller or buyer, guaranteed by audited smart contracts and no human middlemen. Nodemarket.io <laughs>
things are not black and white. The only thing that's black and white is math. We like math. We like game theory because it reduces all of this nebulous stuff into something that you can invest against to try to make your life better. And if you have a rich or a wealth kind of mindset and you look for ways to intellectually arbitrage opportunities, you're going to win more than you lose. You win more than you lose. You'll rise among your peers. You'll have to discard those peers. That is the way it is. You don't see flocks of eagles. (laughs) <laughs> they are birds of prey. They are predators, and they fly alone for the most part, except when they go to Canada and steal people's pets and then smash them on rocks in front of people and eat them. Look it up. It's creepy as hell. Those eagles are dicks. That's why Canadians hate Americans, I think. They're like, they see the bald eagle, this ma- majestic bird flying, and then he goes down, grabs someone's pet, smashes it against a rock 45 times while while thousands of people are snapping away pictures. We hate America. Yeah, I understand. I know what you're talking about. Anyway, we're going to talk uh, especially about dummies and leverage. That's what caused the Bitcoin hiccup last night. There was a Bitcoin was like 44 in, in, in the middle, 4,400, 4,400, 4,400, And then it hicked up down to like 30, uh, 40, sorry, 43 flat, which is nothing, right? But it nuked another $150 million of leverage. And you're like, why the F are people taking leverage on crypto on the way into a bull market when you know that this anemic ass, illiquid ass market is going to go up and down like a meth addict's EKG? Why on earth would you take leverage? What? How stupid do you have to be? You you are a let me say this so everybody get close get, co- get everybody get close get really close to your computer turn it or your phone turn it up real loud don't be a damn fool stop with the leverage and le- and this these people that take on stupid leverage we're gonna read about it I'm gonna read you some little note some little factoids these dummies they are dummies oh I know you don't know none of us know man. None of us. So you can't, oh, I know, man. Look, why why have one Bitcoin when I can have 14 through leverage? Well, asshole, because you don't have any now. Because the price went down 1% and you got nuked, you stupid moron. This happens over and over. It's every time, every time. Same crap was happening. Me and Jerry used to talk about this a lot um, when Jerry and I were doing a lot of broadcasting. Um, Jerry Hall, uh, who's living in Costa Rica, by the way, he's awesome. And we used to talk about this all the time. People take on stupid, stupid leverage when you don't need to. Oh, yeah. Conan, did you see the pictures of Loki? Did you see the new pictures? Dude, he's dope. I don't know if I can get him. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take a I'm going to take a quick. Let me see if I can send a picture to my computer. Oh, this would be tricky. Okay, I'm just going to take one quick moment. Just because the people at Luxury Savannah in Las Vegas were very kind and they sent me some really cool pictures. And I'm going to take one moment to be a little bit of a deviant here. They sent me these pictures of Loki in a like a Christmas basket. I don't know. They probably needed a vascular surgeon after they did this. But that being said, if I can get the picture for you, which I think I can. Let's see. Oh, snap. Hold on. Options. Can I open the picture? Open. Okay. Uh, Let me see. Let me see if I can give it. Here, hold on. Present. Stop screen share. Present. Uh, Screen share. Window. Oh, yeah. Look at that little SOB. Let me go here. Boop. Boop. That right there, my friends is 85% serval. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Let me see if I can go this here. He's going to end up being probably around 40 to 45 pounds, like the blue eyes. His body's mostly gray, and his head and his feet are uh, gold. So hopefully he'll be 
the the little brother that becomes the big brother to keep my other kitty safe. Like the little body, he, he's going to end up being the bodyguard. She might end up being my bodyguard. A little badass. Uh, anyway, this is, by the way, this is what I, this is my Christmas present to me. You say, what do you spend money on? Well, cats. It is a cat. Now it's a cat, but it's, it's a cat to an extent. It's, um, it is mostly serval. And for those of you that are in the know, and I know a few of you are servals are, I know this is completely derivative to crypto. Servals are the smallest of the big cat family. Uh, and they have, by the way, they have the highest, this is a fact you don't need to know, but they have the highest kill rating of any of the big cats. Um, it's 50%. So 50% of the things that these cats go after die, which is badass. Um, but if you haven't had a cat that's kind of wild-ish, this is not a good first cat for you. These guys, they need a lot of attention. They need a lot of stimulation or they will tear your damn life in half. So you have to be, you have to really like cats. I like cats. Cats are badass. Anyway. Um, okay. Let's, let's, let's get back to the cryptos. So the reason I wanted to talk about today, um, what we're going to talk about today is because um, I see a lot of people that, that I don't think understand how markets work and they're late to the game and they think that they deserve this kind of feeling of, you know, do you deserve, do you deserve? And I think that sense of entitlement is what gets a lot of people to take on leverage. This kind of idea that I have to catch up right now. I have to get back in the game because I'm late. It, it is like a race. It's, it's like for those of you that follow formula one, it's like a race. It's a race. And on the track in formula one, or, or on any race, on any track, if you miss the race by an hour, you cannot win that race. Now, you can do good for yourself, but you're not going to beat the teams that started at the beginning of the race. For those of you here, it's unlikely, myself included, that any of us see the kind of, you know, portfolio – appreciation that someone that bought a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin on a lark in 2011. See, there's a lot of people right now that are Bitcoin OGs. Good for them. They had no idea what they were doing. They bought a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin in 2011. It's 10 bucks, man. 10, 10, 10, 115, 35 bucks, 75 bucks. They didn't know what they were doing, most of them. They was, thought it was a cool idea or someone said, hey, dude, buy some Bitcoin. They're like, oh, okay, what the hell? A hundred bucks. Bitcoin's 10 cents. I'll give it. What the hell? None. None of them knew. None. None. And But look where they are now. You have a thousand Bitcoin. You have a hundred Bitcoin. You're doing pretty flipping good, right? So it's unlikely that any of us, me included, are going to experience that. I got in early-ish, 2014, 15, 16, I started putting real money in. But like, real money, what's real money? Nothing compared to those guys that spent 100 bucks in 2010 or 2011. So you can't, you can't be of the mindset that I deserve, I'm late to the party, but I deserve what they got. They got because they're early. It is, it is what it is. They took either a risk accidentally or, or for whatever reason that we didn't take. By the way, the Christmas tree in the background, you guys know what that signifies. That's just 100% because everybody that owned the node market, node market, NFT, as of the 5th, the, the, the midnight of the 5th, all those, I think, 1,443, uh, they get uh, all of the revenue from node market goes to them. Real quick, you guys understand how an OTC works. Let me cover this just for a second. <clears throat> When someone goes to the OTC market and they do a listing, they list this for this or this for this, this, this. You see a lot of these listings are us, as in we go in and fill in the order books. You see it's random prices, 80, 81, 79, 82, 79 and a half, 83, 80, 70. Like we fill in a lot of those orders to keep consistent order books. 
it's not, <laughs> this is not a centralized exchange. There's no central pool of tokens. Everybody here, everybody here is just a wallet to wallet participant. You guys understand that's how OTC works. Also, someone could sell a billion, but man, Tufi could come in here and sell a billion tokens for a penny. It would not move the market. Well, it probably would because people would buy the tokens and then flip them. But sales in an OTC are no different than you transferring tokens from one wallet to another wallet. That's it. It doesn't ping an API. It doesn't send out. It doesn't broadcast to centralized exchanges or DEXs. It doesn't ruin a liquidity pool. OTC transactions are two wallets engaging in barter. You really want to wrap your mind around that. There is a reason why people, institutions, BlackRock, Fidelity, Vanek, all of these firms, they don't purchase anything like Bitcoin. Think about Bitcoin right now. We're going to talk about Bitcoin in a second. They don't purchase anything on the open market. Anything. Anything. They go OTC because otherwise they would be purchasing against themselves. Their purchases would raise the price to make their own purchases more expensive. And yes, humans started with barter. We should love barter. Right? So it, it is important for us all to think we need to understand the, the, the tech that we're using. And there isn't really, and this is why we built this thing. It's for the digital investors, the digital private clients, and the rest of us in the Singularity Net ecosystem to have a way to do commerce with very illiquid tokens in a way that has the zero effect on the market. Why? Because if you sell 10 tokens, some asshole in a Telegram group is going to whine that his bags went down. They're flooding the market. They're, why are they flooding? They're destroying the – shut up. Dummy. OTC. A real OTC. Now, there are other versions of this that claim that, that it is OTC, and it is not. If there's a central party – if there's a centralized custodian, it is not OTC. If I give my offer to purchase to somebody and they go to a central repository, it's not OTC. If my tokens stay or come from a centralized repository, it's not an OTC. It, it's not that it's bad. It's different. So it is important to understand these are distinctions with differences, right? A custodian, a central party, a centralized exchange facility has a pile of tokens, okay? Other markets look at that pile of tokens to determine market price. They weigh it versus other exchanges and how much volume and liquidity they do, or volume they do, liquidity they have. So this, the order book is coming. That's coming very soon, like – we just we're trying to be very careful about it because it's not only that we want to build it. Well, we have built it. It's that we want the experience to be easy. We always look at these things and we say, OK, if I'm looking at this through through unsophisticated eyes, is, does it make sense? Like as I look at it, does it make sense? We're always asking, does it make sense? And if it doesn't make sense, we go back and we retool it. So we're re, we are tooling it so that the ordered book feature looks good. Um, which is, by the way, going to help when you start having commerce with node hypercycle node licenses, because many people will want to trade those licenses and sell those licenses. We will have a fully flushed out marketplace for buying and selling node licenses while they are in production. But it takes this to get there. So there's a, there's some steps. So the whole idea is you have DEXs that have pools of liquidity. When someone goes and sells, it drops the price, sometimes precipitously. When someone goes and buys, it lifts the price, sometimes precipitously. You're getting weird feedback from that. When you look at a centralized exchange, if there's a lot of liquidity, fine. Purchases and sales don't make much of a difference. When there's a very low liquidity, any purchase or any sale makes a huge difference. And again, other facilities like CoinMarketCap, they index those different websites, those different exchanges, and they do some cool math, and they present what they, what they 
believe is the most accurate market price based on those features and in whatever backhanded deals they have in their back pocket. It was also strange. By the way, you guys know that coin market cap is owned by Binance. <laughs> yeah. Old sleazy sleazy. Trying to trying to get back to the UAE for Christmas and then come back and do some time in the United States. Um, so anyway, just understand what an OTC is. Yes, wallet to wallet plus gas plus fees. Now, we're going to take the gas part out. Um, that's our other thing that we're doing um, with this new contract is the gas is going away. Meaning the purchaser would have to pay the gas for one transaction. There would not be a listing fee. There would not be. It's just that that was the first way we iterated. This is now the next way we're iterating. Uh, let's see. Since the bull market has not started, I think it's, yeah, it's not started, it, but it's it's in the starting blocks. Let's say that. You think if someone wants to start now, uh, the thing start to uh, move has a chance. Yes, um, but I think it is important to have to decide. I mean, ooh, if you were starting right now, I would say you don't put any money in in the crypto space. I would say you need minimum six months to learn about the the, the space that you're in, learn about the markets. I really think any anybody in the crypto space that doesn't have six months should not put one penny in the market. Nothing, like nothing, not a penny, because you don't have the experience. And it's not just you as like a random person entering crypto. I don't care. I have a buddy who, I tell you, I have dinner with him every Sunday. We all get together. He runs uh, money. He's a, a fund manager. He was a bond trader for 30, 40 years. He's seen and done everything. He watched and learned crypto for a full year before he put any money in, like any, like anything. Now he's a, he's a whole, he's a coiner. He owns a Bitcoin, some other stuff like that. He, he doesn't have a huge portfolio, but he's in the game, but he took a year and he, and this is a guy that literally knows everything. And he took a year. So what about the rest of us? If you don't have a background in finance, as a matter of fact, if you have a background in finance, you might even be more handicapped than someone coming in off the street. That's a different discussion altogether. But even people that work in finance, they look at crypto and they go, I don't know what the fuck I'm looking at, which is true. This In this space, you get baptized by fire. You have scams and anemic order books and price discrepancies and Fishing and all this kind of crap that comes at you and noise and a bunch of skim. And then you go, okay, well, let me look to the people that are going to teach me. Go look on YouTube. It's full of shit. It's full of people that are trying to steal your shit or to, or, or the bit boys and the cri loco crypto chico and all these other assholes that say the stupidest shit, mostly because they're getting paid sometimes because they're just stupid. There's a lot of stupid out there, but stupid sells. Stupid's very click. It's easy clickbaity, and the kind of people that get sucked into clickbait, they get filled full of hopium, and then they FOMO and they YOLO, and they lose all their shit. And it turns out that this market, like everyone else, is just people giving their money to veterans, right? This is all it is. So, but you have to do. You have to dig on your own. You have to do the research. So, Nick, what, or so uh, what I would say is, you don't do anything for six months. Also. If you have people that are your friends or your family and they're trying to come into crypto now, tell them to piss off. They're going to get blown up, man. They're going to get nuked. They're going to fall into meme coins, whatever's the new sheep, whatever's the new doge, whatever's the new dummy coin. They're going to get sucked into all this stuff. It's going to look like 2021 again. Not, not the same. It'll be different this time. There's going to be a bigger institutional component to it for sure, but – it's a rough space. Yes, well said. It it just takes time. Yeah. What do you? I mean, I got scammed two, three months ago for a million for a million hypercycle, and then got summarily blamed for dumping on the market the tokens that were stolen from me. <laughs> so like, it is what it is, man. This is a very difficult space. I've done very well, but I've done very well. I've been here a long time, and I've gotten my ass kicked. On things where you'd think, like on the investment side, I crush it. I crush my investments. I do my research. I got more winners than losers. That's all you can do. I'm killing it there. I lose on stupid stuff. But every time I get beat up, I go, okay, well, that's that's another thing. 
I lost when I was younger, had nothing to do with crypto. I had a company that I had a bunch of stock in pre IPO stock. And I just left it there and I avoided a buyout offer. I just left it. And then the company got frozen and all the equity got frozen. I lost 5.6 million, $5.625 million overnight. Poof, gone. But it didn't really affect me. I mean, obviously it sucks to lose money, but yeah, it's on paper. It didn't affect me because I wasn't living as if I had that money. I didn't, I don't, in my day-to-day -day life, I don't walk around and spend money like a dummy. I live like someone who makes a very modest LA income, which like in LA, the poverty line's 100K, All right? Like, so, you know, this is just a very tricky space. I have like family members and stuff hit me up when I, when I can't avoid them. I mostly try to avoid them, but when, but when I can, uh, uh, when I can't avoid them, they're like, what should I be doing? I'm like, nothing. You missed it, buddy. We've, we've been, uh, I've been, you know, doing these shows for years. If you don't have time to do that, what you're going to text me once every six months, get a quick catch up because you saw an article on, on, on Bloomberg that now's the time to buy, buy Bitcoin. Dude, I, like everyone else, people in my family, I tell them to go fuck off. I'm nice about it, though. I say, hey, respectfully, fuck off. Like, it's almost insulting. <laughs> it's almost insulting, but it's not. I mean, it is, but it's not. All right. Anyway, so let's talk a little bit about the Bitcoin. Um, the reason we're going to talk about the Bitcoin, one, it's going to lead way to our leverage discussion. Um. Let me see. Uh, not only six months, but someone who will guide you. Yeah. Oof, man. We all get it. It's just tough. Uh, let's see. How do you how do you manage to have that much money being younger? Uh, because I was in a bunch of early stage projects. I I've heard a lot of stories. OK, I was very fortunate, one, to be around a lot of people when I was very young that were very wealthy. We weren't wealthy. Our family, we were a bunch of hack like middle class. But, but uh, we went to all these parties where my parents pretended to be more successful than they were. Fair play. They were faking it till you make it. And I am a very good fly on the wall. And I just listen and just kind of filter. I've always, that's been my gift. I listen and filter stuff. And some stuff resonates, some stuff doesn't. Then early on, I was told that if you want to be rich, Go read about rich people, what they do. Read their, uh, re listen to them talk, uh, listen to their discussions, read what they, what they're writing, and try to absorb that that kind of arbitrage mindset. So I've been doing that for like most of my life. So I'm pretty good at, like I would hear a lot of people say, "Oh, if I had only done this, or if I had only done that." Yeah, I mean, so I would rather lose a little bit of money here and there. And then, um, and not have one of those stories. If I had only done this, I pretty much took a swing at everything I thought had a good opportunity and the things that I didn't think had a good opportunity that I missed. So what? I didn't believe in it. If you don't believe in something and you pass up on it, you can't look back and say, oh, I should have done this. No, you shouldn't have. You did what you did because that's what you did. You used all of your, uh, reasoning and common sense and historical preferences and your cognitive biases and, and whatever version of game theory you might have had, and you made the best decision at a time so at, that, at that moment. You can't regret a decision made. You do regret decisions that you didn't make. And that, that's kind of a that's, a, that's a life point that I think people have to grapple with on their own. When you, hate, so when you say, I'm going to do this, and then you don't, there's going to be some regret buried in there at some point. So I would rather strike out on a few and just, and just do as much research as I can and try to win as often as I can. That's all you can do. But if you don't do the research, you don't deserve shit. Like this, this whole I deserve thing. Oh, so it's kind of part of this. Um, first, let's talk real quick. Uh, spot, spot ETF. Uh, this came from Reuters. Um, Significant progress has been made in discussions between the U.S. SEC uh, and asset managers over the potential approval of Bitcoin exchange-traded funds. We talked yesterday, uh, 
uh, Bitwise and BlackRock made a uh, an adjustment to their S1 filing on Monday. Here we are Thursday. It is Thursday. Yes, Thursday. Uh, so these are significant things. Um, discussions between the U.S. SEC, uh, the U.S. regulator and asset managers hoping to list Bitcoin exchange traded funds spot based um, are now down to technical details in a sign that the agency is likely to soon approve the product. I think January 10th. OK, I think January 10th is a big date no matter what. One, that's the date to punt to punt uh, the ARK investment, uh, ARK Capital or ARK, 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 Kathy's uh, ETF application. But there's right now 13 firms, which includes uh, Grayscale, BlackRock, Invesco, ARK. Uh, I think Fidelity is still on the waiting list. Van Eck, uh, there's a bunch, uh, not sorry. Yeah, yeah, Van Eck. Um, but anyway, they're all awaiting decisions from the SEC on their applications for spot ETFs. And they're all starting to make these little kind of knickknack changes. Um, the SEC has, as you guys know, historically been resistant. However, uh, and they always say like, oh, we want to protect the investors. Yeah, I get it, Gary, except that you, years ago, you allowed a cash settled ETF, which is the worst kind because it's all synthetic. This is a spot settled, which means you have to own the asset. It's way better. And they're like, well, well our concerns are that of, uh, of uh, malicious markets and uh, rigging and fixing them. Yeah, no shit, man. It, like, you think the stock market's clean where you can hide all this stuff in the back and, and, and do quarterly reports and lie to everyone and then go bankrupt? How's we work? How's that doing? Like, come on, man. These are the same guys that let, <laughs> that, that let, um, not, uh, remember uh, Nikola, the, the Tesla knockoff? That had the truck roll downhill, filmed it with the camera tilted, and then and then at one point had a higher valuation than Ford. No shit. Go look it up. Like that's okay. Those guys could go public. Come on, man. So it just feels a little a little weak when you hear those arguments. Like we want to protect investors, Gary, buddy. Bullshit. Um. So, but whatever. You get how it is. There's a big lobby, but. There has been a pretty significant sea change at the SEC following the August court ruling against the SEC's decision to reject Grayscale's spot ETF application. That is a mouthful. Uh, after the court in August ruled that the SEC was wrong to reject Grayscale's application, and basically, if you guys remember, Grayscale was just trying to convert their trust, their Bitcoin trust, into a spot ETF. Um, and so the SEC has been engaged with uh, issuers on these little details and da, da da So they told Grayscale no. Grayscale said, F you, we're going to court. And the court said they handed it back down to the SEC and said, you know, you're – and they're talking to the SEC. They're like, this is, this is not sufficient answer. This is not a sufficient rejection. Please, please try that again. And I think at this point – especially when BlackRock came on board and they said, we want an ETF. The days of Gary just waving things off, that's over with because Gary in a, in a UFC fight against BlackRock, that is not a good fight. Do you guys remember Fred Edish when he fought in the UFC? That, that would be Gary Gensler. And <laughs> the guy that pulverized Fred Edish into a fetal position where he urinated all over himself, that would be BlackRock. So anyway, um, the process has been kind of uh, being amended. Um, the discussions have covered a bunch of aspects from custody arrangements, creation and redemption mechanisms, inventor, uh, uh, inventor, investor risk disclosures. Um, and so essentially, uh, almost overnight, I mean, like within the first 72 hours, it looks like there will be about $3 billion worth of demand for Bitcoin. You say, okay, I mean, that's not super lot. You, let's look at Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin has a market cap of 850. But if you look at exchanges and you see what's on exchanges and how billions of dollars would get deployed in a pretty quick time period, then you realize why this is a, it's definitely a tradable moment. It's probably an investable moment, but, but I'm not going to give anyone advice at all. You do you. I felt like it was time to lean into Bitcoin for myself, for my portfolio, a little heavier than maybe I would have in the past because we're only going to have one time in our life where spot Bitcoin ETFs don't exist 
and then they do. That's not, we're not going to get another bite at that apple. So that's an event. Um, we have a halving coming up uh, late May, April, uh, uh, March, April, May, depending on block sizes and block times. That's once every four-year event. Now, those the, the, the block halving gains typically occur six to 18 months after. But then you start thinking, I guess it makes a lot of sense to be long Bitcoin, even though, yes, it's slow and clunky and orange-pilled idiots like Michael Saylor and Max Kaiser and all those other degenerate assholes out there. They make it look bad to, 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 to own Bitcoin. You got to do what's best for you and for your portfolio. Okay, that's all I'm going to really say about that. But but again, um, the SEC's worries have essentially, or this is what they claim, is that Bitcoin is vulnerable to manipulation. Thank God nothing else in, in the equity market. There's, there's no manipulation. Like in LIBOR, um, there was no manipulation there, right? Like when, like when uh, Jamie Dimon and all those guys got caught rigging the market. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. There's no manipulation there. It's only manipulation when it's crypto. Previously, um, the discussions had focused on the concerns uh, that were kind of mostly educational, like, well, people are just too stupid for this, which is, which is kind of dumb. Um, however, the advanced nature of the of the current discussions with the SEC, which are happening a lot, um, may, may signal that ARC's application and likely – BlackRock, Fidelity, and some of the other ones, um, what a wisdom tree or something like that, are are likely to to go through on this first pass. Well, first pass on on this one, tenth um, uh, of tenth of January. So, and I'm not calling tenth of January as the date. I'm saying price is going to run up into that with the with the assumption a lot of people are going to gamble. Which I mean, a lot of people gamble. Um, people gamble a lot in crypto. Um, last night, probably most of you saw, you know, the price it's 43.7, but it got down to 43 flat. Now it was like, oh my God, it's way down. It's not even a percent, man. It ain't nothing. But, um, in the crypto space where people take stupid, stupid leverage, um, <laughs> there was $150 million in losses due to the volatility in Bitcoin because dumb Moron idiots took on leverage. And it, listen, if you're here, if you're listening and you took on leverage on Bitcoin right now, you're a damn fool. We can still be homies. We can go have dinner together. I'm going to call you a fool to your face. But, you know, like it is what it is. Do not take leverage. Just when, the, when this market goes, it's going to go so fucking fast that most people are going to have nosebleeds. Don't take leverage because it can go for you. If you've taken on leverage, it can go the other way. And you will, you'll watch all these people ring the register and you will just be either wiped out or be sitting in debt. I, I told you one of my friends hit me up. Hey, should I, should I take out a HELOC on my house and buy Bitcoin? No, man. You don't go into debt to, to invest in crypto. Are you crazy? So anyway, the cryptocurrency market experienced a tumultuous day with drastic movements in the price of Bitcoin. Drastic. It went down, it went down 700 bucks. It's not drastic, bro. And check this out. The losses, which, which there, there was 65,600 traders. Let's talk about a bunch of dummies. That, that their losses totaled uh, 150 million, which means... It's just a bunch of nickel and dime people getting their asses kicked, just gambling. Don't gamble, bro. If you're going to gamble on Bitcoin, just buy Bitcoin. Don't gamble on it. You're going to get your money lit on fire. And they're like, well, I'll just do it a hundred times. I'm like, oh, stop. It's not the blackjack table. And you know what? If it was the blackjack table, you'd learn to count cards, score points, and you'd understand what the statistics of, of counting cards and blackjack is. Because I can count cards and blackjack. I learned all that. I don't do it. Because it's you have to live in a casino, but like, and anybody here that wants a fun, you can learn how to count cards in like a month if you practice. You can learn every single hand in blackjack. I don't know if you guys, I'm sure you guys know this. You can learn every conceivable hand in blackjack. You can learn how to count cards. It's pretty badass. It makes you feel like something, but you can't. There's no point. Anyway, 
Um, but it's just a fun statistical experiment. Um, anyway, Bitcoin price went from like 44.1 to 43.6, $500. And then it, it bounced back to 44,000. So what happened is that extreme volatility trapped a bunch of idiots who were long with leverage, betting on the price to just go up forever because stupid. And 70% of those liquidations corresponded with traders that had long positions. So that's that's about 45,000 dummies that got nuked for anywhere from 100 to to $10,000. The most significant liquidations occurred in Bitcoin, somewhere in Ethereum. It wasn't all Bitcoin. Um, and there was a couple of other little dummy coins. Um, oh, another one was Ordi, which is a, is a, it's a dummy coin. Anyway, um, oh. <laughs> and so most of the uh, liquidations were Binance. Uh, second was OKX, and I think Bybit had a uh, had twenty two million in liquidations. Anyway, Bitcoin's fine. Everybody that owns things directly are fine. The only people that really got punished are people that took on leverage. Man, don't take on leverage. So that's kind of that will that will dovetail. Yes, if anybody that's here right now. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna go behind the wall. I'm, we're gonna do our are kind of educational thing today, just directly public. I want to see a hundred and there's 153 people. I want to see 153 people click the like button, which you won't do because apparently that's too difficult. And not only that, but I want you to put, I will not take on leverage. And at least you wrote it somewhere. <laughs> I will not take on leverage. Yes, I will not take on Flipping leverage. See, I love this. It's good. It's good. I will not. I will not. I will not take on leverage. I will not take on leverage. This is so important. I know it, it sounds silly. Why would I have to type it? Because if you type it, maybe it will like steer it to your brain box. Do not take leverage. Do not take leverage in any way, shape, or form. If you want to sell leverage, by all means, sell those idiots all the leverage you want. But do not take on leverage. See, this is a good group. I know that this is a group that's going to make it. These are the future millionaires that I'm going to be sitting on. I'm going to be borrowing your couch space. <laughs> All right. Good, good, good. I like it. I like seeing that. Well, not take on leverage. I never. Ooh, Sam, I like your style, buddy. I haven't and I won't. Well, you can't say never, Sam. We, know, we don't know what we never will or never won't do. We can only say we endeavor to. <laughs> 39 likes. Yes. I know that there's at least 39 people that want to make money. <laughs> All right. Um, instead of going behind the wall, we are definitely going to start our class classroom. Oh, I got a cool picture for it too. I got a cool classroom picture. I'll show you in a second. Hello. You're late. You're bad at math, but I'm giving you an A plus in confidence. Just doing what I got to do. Extra credit. So good. <laughs> it's so good. Look at all these dummies. That's what I wrote in uh, – so this is Dolly 3, uh, GPT-4 Turbo. I wrote in um, – the, the prompt was a bunch of dummies looking uh, quizzically at charts on Wall Street. <laughs> this is what I got. Pretty good. Um, okay, so let's – let me let me back off a little bit um, from the intensity uh, cause this is very intense. This is a very intense topic. People take on leverage, man, man, gamblers, you call a gambler out, they get angry. They're like a little, like a little old angry wombat, like a, like a damn honey badger. Um, it's very tough to, um, to admit to ourselves that we too may be gamblers. Look, if you're in the crypto space, if you're in investing at all, you're already gambling. Right? There's a bit of gambling. We can say, oh, we do fundamental analysis and we do all these things. But, you know, we are gambling. I mean, be honest with yourself. Now, we like to think that we have an advantage over the rubes, which I think we do, but we don't know that we do. We just have to use our portfolio growth or lack of growth to quantify that. So uh, today we're going to delve into – what I think is a pretty relevant topic in our modern investment world, and that is the allure and dangers of leverage, especially for new entrants in the market. 
So as we witness an influx of all these new investors, happened in 2021, happened in 2017, it's going to happen again, I think, in 2024, many of whom are racing to catch up with their either more seasoned counterparts, they're trying to catch up to veterans, trying to catch up to the dude with the Lambo, which, I mean, all those crypto Lambo people, they had to give all their Lambos back. Anyway, at least BitBoy did. Ah. Anyway, leverage has become a tool of choice for the newer entrants that are seeking rapid financial gains, um, and they get told by gurus that this is how it works. And But what happens is this, this gets misused. Um, it gets abused. And, th and then, what, then they're like, oh, well, I have to do this. I have to do this in order to catch up. Um, so in this discussion, we're going to explore not just the mechanics of leverage, but also the implications through the lens of game theory, because everything we do is through the lens. This is, this is the whole point is that if, if I can pass on just this one thing, the ability to look at the investment world through game theory, it, that one little piece right there, if there's, if there's nothing else you ever get from Nick and Brandon, if this is all you get, it, it is absolutely worth at least the first million bucks you make. Okay. Nick Black Um, uh, Accepting gifts now. No, I'm just kidding. Don't send me shit, man. I got shit. Anyway. Um, when you're when you're looking at the mechanics of leverage, you look at the you look at the implications through our lens of game theory, how we make decisions. It is a powerful tool for understanding strategic interactions between players in the game. Who are players in the game? Those are the financial markets. That's who we're we're working. We're arbitraging. You're going to see how new investors in their pursuit of quick gains, because everybody thinks they deserve now in this kind of super social culture that we live in, I deserve, I, I deserve a win. I deserve the winning lottery ticket. No, none of us deserve shit. You have to work for it. Now, it doesn't mean you have to work forever and it doesn't mean you can't get lucky, but luck is not a strategy. Winning the lottery is not a strategy. Like, how are you going to get rich and win the lottery? Um, how, how, do you, how do you work hard at winning the lottery? So, New investors tend to have this idea of quick gains when, when it's kind of it's – Im, it's embarrassingly clear that, that not only investing but the crypto space specifically, it's a very complex game. And the stakes are very high because you're trading moments of your life for currency units and then you're punting those currency units into the market. Yeah, it's the participation trophy generation. You nailed it. Uh, so – but the stakes are very high and, you know, the rules are not obviously so clear. So let's go to the basics. Um, in the realm of investment, game theory is our framework for understanding strategic decisions. And the investment market, all of them, is essentially a non-zero-sum game, right? The gains and losses of investors are all kind of interconnected. One person can't have it all because then there's no market. The whole market disappears. So newer investors that enter the markets, obviously, they may not come from financial background. And, and so what happens is they, they perceive it as a win-lose zero-sum game where to win, they have to outperform others that must lose, particularly those with more time or sophistication experience. If your game plan is – um. I am going to go into this brand new market where I don't know much, and I'm going to beat all these people that have been here for a decade. That is not a good strategy. <laughs> that, is, that is a biased, maybe partially oblivious, moronic-ass strategy. So they typically, new investors overlook some critical aspects. One, one is – especially like in the regular equity markets, information asymmetry. Experienced investors have access to better information and deeper understanding of market dynamics. I would put this group right here, the, the, the digital investor group. I would put you guys as the corpus of us up against any other, any, any other pile of investors. Because, and I can say this, they're doing it wrong. The reason I know they're doing it wrong is because we consistently do it right. 
everybody can't do it right. If everybody did it right, there'd be no markets would be flat, right? So there is information asymmetry. There's also intellectual asymmetry. New investors um, trying to level the playing field quickly, what do they do? They turn to leverage. So they borrow cash, they borrow capital, or they go somewhere where they can amplify their investment capacity. And yes, you can magnify gains and you can exponentially increase the risk of severe losses. A uh, reality which is kind of underappreciated until you've until it's all gone. Um think at, at Binance, they were doing a hundred, there were people taking on a hundred X leverage, a hundred X leverage on Bitcoin. And what happened is because of the way you get nuked is that the fat kids, they would take, they would put 10 grand in there. They take a hundred X leverage. And if the price of Bitcoin went down by 0.67%, 67 basis points, less than a percent. Matter of fact, today it's gone down by Three, ten, uh, three, three quarters of a point, you would be completely liquidated. Your whole position gone at 100x leverage. You don't, you don't have to go down a full point. They start liquidating you almost instantly. So it's just gambling. So, and leverage is a, is a double-edged sword. There's different kinds of leverage. You say, oh, I'm buying a house. I'm taking on leverage. Yes, I understand that. You wouldn't treat this market the way you would treat a real estate investment, okay? That's a different animal. And, and leverage can be a double-edged sword. So it's like playing a high-stakes game where you're not fully aware of the rules and all of the risks involved. Because anybody that was really aware of the rules and the risks that was buying this kind of leverage is a fucking idiot. You, you just are. There's no way around it, and there's no one that can give me a good argument for why you would need to take leverage. So, oh, I have an advantage. No, you don't. Because anybody that had an advantage would have all the money. It's just leveraged gambling. And it tends to be more for inexperienced investors and they take on excessive leverage, like you know, betting all their chips in a single play when the first time they go to Vegas. Like, I saw a movie once where this, yeah, I know, dot, dot, dot. I saw a movie once, great. Um. And the potential, when you take on leverage, losses are not linear. They are exponential. Remember, we did a whole thing last week. Was it last week on compounded interest and how that's how you get wealthy. You get wealthy with compounded interest. You make your, your money your employees, and they make more employees. It's like a sweatshop, but like the good kind. Like not, not like, the, like the Taiwan places that make like the clothes that we wear, but like – a good kind of sweatshop where your money has little babies and those little monies go to work and those little monies go to work. And soon you have 50 generations, of little money earning monies, right? Your money is your employee. That's the kind of leverage you want. You want the, you want the benefit of compound interest. The other side is danger with leverage compounds when volatility increases. And guess what? If a couple of people take on leverage and a couple of people get wiped out, that increases it amplifies volatility. So what does that do? Well, then that amplifies not only the danger, but also the, the losses that other people incur during these market swings. You see the big leverage players get nuked. You see the small leverage players get nuked. A couple of days later, you see the people with margin calls get wiped out unless they, unless they uh, get their margin call. You see trailing stops getting targeted. You see it all happens because a couple people take stupid leverage when you don't need to. And and it just takes a minor market correction, and it starts what we call cascading liquidations. So when you're, when you're thinking about these things, because people take high leverage, it makes it where less of a change in price creates a bigger setback. Does that make sense? And then the conventional investor sits back and they go, my portfolio is going down. What's going on? This must be a scam. No, man, it's just a couple of people gambling that asshole it for everyone else. And it can be catastrophic for someone who's highly leveraged. So this is why we will, not, we will not take on leverage, right? So the recent history of financial markets is littered with examples of dummies, even large institutions that faced ruin due to over leverage. Think about last year. How many companies went out of business for taking on leverage, for gambling, for being stupid? They weren't all criminals. Some, most of them were, but not all of them. Doquan, criminal. Yes. 
Bankman Freed, criminal. Yes, but not at first. He was just really, really bad and tried to cover his badness with gambling and tried to cover his gambling with lying and cheating and stealing. Now he became a criminal. Everybody that helped him, criminal. Straight up criminal. He just be, he's a, he's a would-be criminal. The guys at Celsius, criminals. BlockFi, hard to say, probably stupidity. Three Arrows Capital, absolutely criminal. All the people that supported Three Arrows, stupid. If you have exposure to any of these people that recommended or had exposure to Three Arrows, Celsius, BlockFi, FTX, go down the list. Be careful because those people don't have your best interest at, in their mind, all right? So in the game of investing, we now have to think, okay, well, what is this, this, this entitlement thing? This, I talk about this a lot. Like it really irks me, the psychology of entitlement, right? And new investors enter the market late with a sense of entitlement to quick gains. I say, I used to ask my mom, hey, can I do anything I want when I grow up? She says, yes, you can be anyone you want. I said, cool, can I be an astronaut? She's like, mm, maybe you better focus on those janitorial skills. Ah, oh, shit. Mom was right. So what happens is, especially in social media, there's a couple of stories of a few people getting rapid wealth. And you all go, well, ah, shit, why, why not me? I, I want the rapid wealth. Uh, I deserve it. I've been good. I've been good for Christmas. I deserve the big win. I deserve to be rich, have the boats and all this other the Lambos and bullshit. Why? Because three randos on YouTube or TikTok show you how they got rich real quick. Or you'll hear some story, some mostly bullshit stories that are passed down uh, in the crypto media or on Twitter. This dude made this much with this thing. Yeah, gambling, gambling. And so newcomers with their, you only live once, fear of missing out, they become incredibly overconfident, add that to their entitlement. And overconfidence is a huge Achilles heel in investing, and it blinds them to the risks, not only that, it makes them think that they don't need to do any work, that they just deserve a win for showing up. Hey, I'm here. I've been here 13 seconds. I guess I just deserve a win. Get off the gas. So it blinds newer investors. This sense of entitlement that is kind of cooked into a lot of people right now, and it's not just young people. It's like all, all people. People think they deserve. None of us deserve shit. None of us. You got you to gotta do the work. And again, if you do the work, it doesn't mean you have to wait 20 years to win. But don't expect to win in 20 seconds, right? So when you get blinded by I deserve, I'm entitled, overconfidence, you tend to lean towards relying on leverage. And so the mindset of entitlement and impatience, not being able to kind of pleasure delay, that makes you – create a series of strategic miscalculations. And in game theory terms, these investors are choosing high risk, high volatility, high reward strategy that does not adequately factor the probability of these different loss outcomes on their, on their portfolio. The, the level of loss is almost guaranteed, not quite, but almost guaranteed. And so, you think, okay, great. Well, how can new investors, because you're going to have people asking you, how should I get into crypto? The key, I think, is to, for, for newer investors, and I say new if you've been around six months or less, is adopt a strategy that balances risk and reward, okay, while acknowledging your own limitations. N you need to really think about what you don't know. Like, okay, make a list of stuff you don't know or don't understand, right? And Many of these things, once you attack them and learn them, you start going, oh, oh, okay. Now I can see that without this new bit of knowledge, I was making really dumb decisions earlier. We all make dumb decisions if we don't have knowledge. That's information asymmetry. Information asymmetry doesn't just mean that there's a group of people that are on the inside that know all the cool shit and that you don't. No. Information asymmetry is if you know the things that you don't know, the, 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 the sectors or the, the 
bits of education or if you know there are cloudy, murky parts in your own personal education, that's an asymmetry. At least it's a known unknown, right? You can't deal with the unknown unknowns, but you can deal with the known unknowns. I don't understand Fed funds. I don't understand yield curves. I don't understand government debt. I don't understand dot, dot, dot. Then, okay, make a list and knock it out. Education is, is, is super paramount. So you need to understand market dynamics. You need to understand the nature of leverage. You need to understand the implications of various investment strategies. You need to understand your own risk tolerance. You need to understand a personal balance sheet. Hello, income, expenses, assets, liabilities, cash flow. I spent 30 minutes last night talking to a friend of mine trying to convince me that owning a house was an asset because if you wait long enough, it's worth more than you bought it. No shit, moron, because fucking government printing and debasement of currencies makes the dollar price of assets go up. But the value is not. If I have a – listen, man, man, you guys know how it works. At just a 2% interest rate, right, 2% inflation, every 20 years your buying power is cut in half. Anybody here have a 20-year loan on a house? No, most people do a 30. So what does that mean? If your buying power is reduced by half, it means your dollars only buy 50 cents worth of shit, and the house doubles in value, have you gained anything? Are you rich now? Are you making money off that house that, by the way, you had to service, air conditioning, roof, ceiling, paint, yard, maintenance, all that? Oh, by the way, property tax, forget about that. That doesn't count. Think about it. Think about it. No, you're making nothing. Nothing. That's 2%. What about, oh, I've got a great interest rate, 5%. Do the math on that. Do the math on 8 or 9%, what they're pushing out right now. That means on a $5 million house, I know this is like weird, but like you're paying $30 million over 30 years. Think about that for a second. You're lighting three to $350,000 a year on fire in interest, and you're not paying back the principal. Think about that for a second. Yeah, yeah, owning a house is a great decision. It can be as an investment. And I'm just using this to kind of jostle your mind. You have to factor these things. And this is why I recently backed out of the housing market. I've been looking at a house for so long, you guys know. I mean, a long time. Dude, if I wouldn't recommend it to one of my clients, I can't do it myself. So I backed out. That's why I bought all that Bitcoin. I'm like, well, I'm not just going to leave this down payment sitting on Coinbase. So I pushed it to Kraken. I bought some Bitcoin. And so far, so good. But you, you have to factor all this stuff. And you, have to, and you have to do. So, well, let me back up. You don't have to do anything. I urge you to think about first education. Look at the things that you don't know and just and go make a list. You don't have to knock it out today, but make a list. Most people won't, but those of you that do, it's going to really pay off. Okay. Um, understand the basic market dynamics. Understand things like, you know, how a centralized exchange works, how a decentralized exchange works, how an OTC works, like understand the tools that you have. Those are your tools. Understand the market dynamics, understand the danger of leverage and that other people may be taking on leverage and that may make your market much more wobbly and volatile, right? Understand that when people get into to crisis situations, they behave stupidly, right? Second, uh, was well, not second, it's like fifth, have a longer term perspective. Short-term gains, very tempting. They look juicy, but that's not how you're going to get rich. Remember, rich, wealth, poor, those are mindsets. You need to have a wealth mindset, a longer-term mindset. Delay the gratification for right now for the bigger payoff so that you have – your parachute is so big that the wingtips never touch the ground, right? And this this – Game theoretical game of investing rewards patience and it rewards strategic thinking. Um, practice risk management, right? So 
diversify your portfolio with within your own mental limits. You know, having everything in one asset, I don't know. And Sam, I did DCA into Bitcoin. It's just that my version of DCA and yours are probably different because I've been here for a while. I'm trying to get that third comma, bro. And I ain't going to do it at two Bitcoin at a time. <laughs> Not to be a dick. Um, so yes, short-term gains, very tempting. It's exciting. Um, but patience, strategic thinking, diversify as much as you can wrap your mind around it, especially when we know that we are very likely going into a, a larger bullish market. Um, plan for things not going your way. Plan for things not going as expected. Take on no leverage. Um, the whole idea behind investing is you do as much work as you can. You know that not all of your decisions are going to pay off. You're going to have some losers. It is what it is. There's nothing uh, on the sidelines. There's just only so much we can do. Some teams are just going to shit the bed. It is what it is. Even teams with great ideas are going to shit the bed. <laughs> That's it. So survive to play another day, right? Keep, keep limits within your portfolio. Keep position limits. Keep position percentages. That's why we do it every week. We do our, um, on usually on Mondays, we do our portfolio check. Um, you know, the only way to win big is to lose less, right? Um, Short-term Wins are not really the name of the game. Um, I have no intention of dumping my Bitcoin position anytime soon because we, uh, you know, we have a lot of what I think is very pro crypto news coming. So um, I feel fortunate, but not entitled. Let's put it that way. I feel very fortunate, but not entitled. I feel fortunate that we are still early. Everybody here is probably pretty early. Um, oh, uh, OTC, Mary, is um, over-the-counter, an OTC exchange, kind of like node market. Well, exactly like node market. Matter of fact, node market's the only one. So let me, let me reduce all that. Um, and I'm not just like blowing smoke. It is the only code-based OTC. There are no others. And anybody that says it is, it's bullshit. Go and look. Who's your custody agent? Ah, if they have an answer, it's not an OTC. Oh, just go contact these guys. It's not an OTC. If you, use this, if you have a centralized party involved, it's not an OTC. Okay? An OTC transaction is no different than you just moving tokens from one wallet to another. That's how lean and elegant it needs to be. Anyway, um, kind of to, to bring all this to, uh, to, to reduce all this, um, leverage in investing is a tool that needs to be used with caution. Um, in my opinion, not at all. You can sell leverage, and I believe selling leverage makes a lot of sense. Be the casino, right? Um, but for new investors, um, recognize that quick gains are not a path to success. It is a high-risk gamble. You're not entitled to anything. You deserve nothing, period. None of us do. None of us deserve anything. What you deserve is what you go out and get, what you work for. So adopt a more strategic a more informed, a more patient approach. And I know no one wants to hear that going into a bull market. Patience, I'm trying to get rich now. No, you, you get rich by being consistent. Uh, this is, we were in Chicago. What was it? Um, we did the um, Monday Morning Live had a, last year, they had a thing in Chicago. And I said, uh, do you know how you get poor? Slowly at first and then all of a sudden. That's also how you get rich. Slowly at first, and then all of a sudden. And so if you're a strategic thinker and you build your knowledge and you build your patience and your prudence, you, those are your assets. Think game theoretically, understand that we are biased, understand the tools at your disposal and understand the markets that you're playing in. If you know how the gears in the watch turn, you will have an advantage. If you don't, you're going to lose. You're going to hand your money off to veterans. I mean, I guess I should be talking, this should be the opposite. I should be pushing everybody to take on stupid ass leverage and just sit back and collect and just collect from stupidity. But that just feels sketch. Anyway, um, take some time to, again, what we always say, think about thinking. Um, and this is going to put you ahead. Look at all these rubes, all these purple tie guy, purple tie. Oh, that's a girl. 
purple tie girl and this dude who looks like the dude in the middle is like two versions of himself. Matter of fact, it's almost all the same dude that like, like a, is it Alan Greenspan? Just completely flummoxed. Doesn't know what he's looking at. He's looking at fed funds. He's gone. I, I don't understand. Of course he doesn't understand. Anyway, um, how to DCA in a bull market. Um, invest and reinvest. That's a whole, that's a whole thing. And that's probably a great subject that we'll probably, we'll probably talk about maybe next week. Um, well, we can talk about it tomorrow as well, but then we do that behind the wall, uh, with the publicly exposed stuff. I'd rather not get into too much investment stuff. Anyway, um, let's, let's put a button on it for today. Uh, stay in school. Don't do drugs. Don't do anything. My poor insolvent drunk, strong on meth grandmother or Brandon wouldn't do, which is very little. Um, if you think there are other people that could get something out of this, forward the video because, man, it's gonna, you're going to wear yourself out <laughs> trying to have these discussions with people. And as we go into the holidays, it's going to happen more and more, and it's gonna, you're going to be fatigued, man. Fatigued AF. So throw this video to somebody you think might need a little flip and wake-up call. And we will see you guys tomorrow. Are you tired of all the uneducated noise you're getting from the droves of YOLO meme coin peddling douchebag gurus out there trying to use you as their exit liquidity? Would you rather learn a competent university-level set of skills that will guide you in managing and investing for the rest of your life? Join us three days a week at Digital Investor. Develop your knowledge of game theory, cognitive bias, macroeconomics, monetary theory, investment theory, psychology of the crowds, and more. For more info on Digital Investor and how it can help you, reach out at nickblacknext.com.